end of the packet. <laughs> Guess we have a little musical accompaniment. I really miss the television. I mean, what happened to it? <laughs> it's over there. Oh, there is television. Oh, oh yeah, we're being televised. So when the I music think. started playing, I just thought the system was down. When it's weird enough. No red light to look at. I know. It's on there, but... Well, at any rate, um, the chart at the end of your packet, I think, is one that uh, I found interesting and would like to just call your attention to. Without a little help, I did find it um, somewhat confusing, and I hope I don't just confuse the issues uh, more so. But uh, if you, once you understand how to read it, Lyle's point is, is that there's really a very small gap. In other words, when, once you are in the upper 10 percent of the MEAs, the number of uh, answers, for instance, it makes a difference between being in the 90th percentile and the 96th percentile might be two might be three, depending on the total count, uh, so that the, you're really getting to the top of that curve and uh, so that when you look at the scores and they go uh, a few points, you wonder where that is. It's a very small spread. It tightens right up. Um, it does, he, what also is, is drawing, if you notice on the right-hand side of the, of the page, uh, there's a fourth grade. You can see right at the end, grade four, 1990, and then grade eight, 1994. Uh, this particular class, of course, is not all the same students. There have been some changes back and forth, but our, our grades tend to be within about 25 percent as a given number, the same um, youngsters in the class. Uh, there certainly has been some improvement in those scores between grades four and grade eight, and that's what the chart really demonstrates. If you follow those lines down, you have about a 92 percent at the grade four level, um, and in some cases, uh, it, it's up to the 99 percentile, particularly in math. Um, again, I think the, uh, some of the issues that we've looked at in the past, um, one of the things that we've looked at as far as boys and girls differences, and you may recall that we have looked at the, not only the uh, math and science gap between boys and girls favoring boys, but also the reading and writing gap between boys and girls um, where boys show up at a disadvantage. Uh, this year, um, there seems to be some improvement or at least a lessening of those gaps, if you'll notice the differences. And he, in the middle of that uh, particular page, he showed that where there is a 13 um, point favor for the girls in reading, last year there was an 82 point. I mean, that's certainly narrowing that gap. And although the writing um, this year is 35, points uh, favoring the girls. Last year it was 103, so there is a narrowing of that gap. Now, one of the things that I really need to caution any of the, any person looking at these, um, this is a very small sample. Our, our numbers of students are so small that these differences clearly can be changed from year to year just because of, of a few uh, strengths or weaknesses among individual students, so that we shouldn't read too much into that. But it, it is interesting to note that um, that that doesn't stay at a, um, as big a gap as we saw. Um, math, we, we continue to test um, as far as state comparisons, which is what this is, uh, at a very strong level. Again, however, you need to understand that a 400 in the state MEAs does not give you a world-class standard. It's a standard within the state of Maine. Um, that's not to say that there's anything wrong with getting a 400 or that that should be seen as a problem. It's just trying to give a reality check um, and so forth. There are some other differences um, noted here. Uh, I think it's interesting to notice uh, w streaming at some of our uh, youngsters with handicapping conditions where those youngsters are still scoring against state averages in a very strong manner, which uh, says something, for, I think, for both the students' willingness to work hard and the programs. And then there are some comparisons, again, which are really on the chart between grades four and grade eight. Now, I'll try to answer questions. Right. And back to the, um, on the second page at the top, the Cape Elizabeth scores versus the state, mm -hmm. boys versus girls. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that our gap on reading and writing is quite close compared to what the state is. Mm. It's like right. 98 and 68. 
And we're like 35 and 13. And right. it's right. a positive. Mm -hmm. what, what does bother me a little bit is that in science, on a local le level, there's quite a gap. On a state level, it's not quite as I don't, have, I don't have any experience. And then uh, my biggest, my biggest, uh, here I come with my social studies again. <laughs> At a state level, there's only like a, a very small, it's all negligible, but within the system, it's quite high. And one of the things I think that did kind of strike out to me is the social studies have just steadily gone down since 85. There was a period of time for about five years that it stayed stable, and then it's been going down about the last mm -hmm. four years. That's mm -hmm. one of the areas that wasn't tested last year. Um, but the year before it was 340, right. so it's, it's leveled off. It still has gone down considerably. Right. Yeah. And the fact that we also have a, a, gender, a gender disparity. That's one I know I really don't understand. I don't understand. Um, as a youngster, I always loved history. So as a girl, I always thought, Actually, that was one of those subjects the girls liked. Um, and I have been a, somewhat surprised in watching the gender gaps that have occurred. I've, and I have talked to some girls about it. I've talked to some teachers about it. It may be the way in which we uh, think of uh, social studies, although I think a lot of the materials we use nowadays, kids do read um, you know, historical fiction, which does appeal to girls and so on. I'm, I don't know why that is. Mark? Uh, just a couple of comments. Last year, uh, I had some significant concern about the gender gap, reading and writing, specifically boys versus girls. And this year, it's down to a non-significant <coughs> level, which is terrific. I'm just curious as to uh, what, Nancy, perhaps you would feel that may be due to whether that was just pure randomization or whether there was any real changes in curriculum or approach to try to address that gender gap. I'd really love to be able to come up here and tell you we figured out the gender gap, because I think we could make a lot of money off the answer. Um, however, I, this is an interesting occurrence, and we're very pleased with it, but it hasn't happened in a regular pattern enough for us to really establish that we figured it out. Um, and I know we've really just tried to encourage all readers and writers. Um, other than that, I don't think we found anything magic yet, and it will be interesting to see what the gap looks like next year. I, I am pleased with this year's improvement, but as I said, I caution us, we don't have a pattern here yet. And so, that's when we'd really look back and analyze what we've been doing maybe a little bit more carefully for did we finally find it. I know the teachers have really tried to make sure that topics that students are encouraged to write about, the types of writing that they do, the types of reading is appealing across the student body, not specific to any one particular group and have really tried and worked very hard to improve the varieties and that may be something that's helping us. Great, thank you. Can, I just want to make, an, I want to make a, just an observation having been in the system 11 years or having children in the system 11 years. This particular eighth grade class was actually one of the first whole language classes to start in our system. I think it was the first class. It's interesting, considering our history of whole language in the last um, eight years or five years. You're doing all right, Mark. And I, I don't. It is interesting. Uh, it's difficult to sort out what that means. The the difference that is shown in terms of the fourth to eighth grade is certainly a great improvement, and one could either subscribe that to the late blooming concept of whole language or to remarkable recovery by the middle school effort, and I suspect it's some of both. Um, so that, that's certainly very reassuring to see. And then my, my final comment is just um, that I, I would hate to forget that writing is always, in our district, lagging behind. And uh, th that's been pr fairly consistent for a while. And, and while it's greatly improved from before, uh, it, it would still be great to see if it would rival math and reading and, and other things that we traditionally have scored very well in. And uh, uh, again, just the input from parents in terms of the mechanics of writing, grammar, in fact, just having discussed with a teacher <coughs> this past week how exactly the grammar piece fits in and where that is 
I just really encourage that we continue to look at that oral, da oral daily language is terrific, uh, but I still think there's there's a piece that we could add to it somehow to to bring writing up to the to the to par with the other areas that we've seen do very well in this in this uh, grouping. Charles? Just one other observation: <laughs> where there's no gender gap in the math program, and you're you've been considering some changes to that math program. This this points to some success. <laughs> yes, it, it certainly does. Um, I think when Lyle gets here next month, he'll be able to talk to you a little bit about the difference in um, how many answers you might get wrong in math and still get a 400, as opposed to how many answers you may answer incorrectly and only get a 340 in writing or a 370 in reading, and there is a vast difference. I think the state of where language arts development is across the state is a little bit different than what it is in mathematics. Although, also nationally, Maine tested very well on the national education assessment test in math, and I think in fourth grade they were number one or two, and in eighth grade they were number four or something like that. So um, that, that is an indication that it's not all horrible. Last night when we did our curriculum presentation for mathematics, we did talk about all students and difficulties that they've seen, not specific to young gentlemen or young ladies, but just all mathematicians as they get into a certain area that seems to be very difficult for them and maybe slowing that pace down. I think you would find that many of the questions on the MEA are well matched with our transition math program and with the improvement in the math curriculum as the people who develop that test are very cognizant of the NCTM standards, the National Council of Teacher of Mathematics. And our curriculum has been focused around those standards K through 12. So that is something that I think we we should do well in mathematics. We may not always get a 400, but we should do well because our curriculum does match those kinds of standards, and that's the kind of thing we aim for. But I think just to close the gender gap, because historically, boys have always kind of outpaced girls, and now to see that that, that gender gap has been closed. Right, it, and, and our history here in Cape Elizabeth, though, has been there hasn't been a tremendous gap in math, which, which is an interesting phenomenon. Maybe we do have the right answer in mathematics and we could go public with it and earn some more money for mm -hmm. some other projects. Anybody else? I, I would just hope on this um, gender gap issue, it certainly is gratifying to see the lessening this year, but as Connie pointed out, this is one year. It's a really small sample. It's hard to tell. I hope we'll just continue to track all the test results we get for evidence that we're doing things better or maybe maybe not doing so well, but it certainly is encouraging. Okay. okay. Um, my next point is uh, update on, I included a parent-teacher communication survey, which is uh, roughly tabulated in your packet. It is coming back uh, shortly with a better um, and more complete report, but just wanted to give you an idea that was going on. We did have another meeting of our Quality Council last Thursday um, where I think we, we it's really, um, I think, an exciting, sometimes almost overwhelming moment when we have business parents and, and school people trying to figure out what we can do to really improve schools, not just a little bit, but really. And um, uh, so that is sort of an exciting moment. And I am going to at least show you, this is a rough draft of our, our uh, support services manual that we, I talked about as part of our, our quality service efforts. Um, there are some pieces now that we have to um, rearrange and there's some material in the back that we, that was put in there for our consideration that we're probably going to either take out or boil down or change slightly. But it is a kind of a nice moment when you actually get a product finished. And so I only have this one copy and I will pass it along and ask you to, well, we'll start it down here and you can kind of glance through it. So you see it does exist and then hopefully within a month or by next month you all have your own copies. You may recall that one of the purposes of that manual is not only information within the system, we will also, uh, since we will be able to copy that and it is our own work, uh, print it up through our own um, um, 
resources, we will be able to make that available to anybody in the district um, or in the town who's interested in how we run our systems. Again, it doesn't answer all questions, but it is an example of how we have tried to um, use a customer orientation. Here's the service, here's how you access it. To some degree, what are the costs? Here are some clear, we hope, step-by-step -step procedures. We have a lot of calls in the business office, for instance, from teachers or other staff who are, you know, all kinds of, of issues that we've never really written down and made available to people. It sounds like such a common sense thing to do. You may say, well, why haven't you done it before? However, we're, we're pleased that we've gotten this far and we are excited that finally so much of what we do is ongoing and never ending. It's great to have a product. So I will give you a copy as soon as it's finished. Okay. Great. Moving on. Um, transition committee. We have a group of approximately, oh, if everybody's there, 15 people that have been meeting. Um, now we've had two meetings and we'll continue to do so. Uh, we're calling it a transition committee and here are minutes from, uh, I didn't include them in your packet because I just got them yesterday, from uh, our first meeting a week ago. We had another meeting yesterday. I think you may need another one. There you go. Two more. Two more. Hmm. I'll look on. We'll you share. You can look on with me? Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't count right. Oh, okay. Um, what this is is a group of people, if you look at the um, folks who've been meeting, there's some from the central office. We have Bob Bennett, our head custodian, Sue Weatherby, um, and then we have uh, administration and teachers from both buildings. Uh, the move, the renovation, and preparing the buildings for um, the various things that are going to have to happen this summer is extremely complicated. The asbestos removal requires us to empty both buildings entirely. All desks, all books, anything that is movable has to be packed up and put out uh, in other kinds of uh, containers in one way or the other. Um, and that, that alone is a massive effort. And then after the asbestos removal, we have to put things back so that we are ready to start school uh, early in September. Uh, I've been very impressed with the spirit, the cheerfulness. I mean, there's even laughter going on in this. Sometimes I think maybe it's almost helpless laughter, but at any rate, um, people are bringing a wonderful sense of can-do into these discussions. Um, I would call your attention to a couple of things just to give you a sense of some of the problems that we're looking at. Uh, if you look at the second page, and I thank Mary Ann Brown for um, our secretary at Pine Cove, uh, one of our secretaries at Pine Cove who attends the meetings and took these minutes for us. Um, we asking uh, one of our issues is exactly where we'll locate the Pine Cove Media Center and we're having some discussions about that. Uh, a a, a uh, very practical issue that came up, what about foot tra traffic between uh, Pine Cove and middle school? At, right now, of course, we have a number of classes that that are shared or, or students going back and forth. Um, the, this discussion led to a recommendation that we um, actually amend our proposal for the planning board to show two portables, uh, two of the five portables we will have outside Pond Cove and move them to the middle school so that we can locate uh, fourth grade entirely at the middle school setting next year. That will cut down on foot traffic, which will be a problem because the area between the two buildings is it will be fenced off with gates and so forth. Uh, it has to be entirely turned over to the construction project itself. We will be able to walk between the buildings on the sidewalk between the two buildings and looking at traffic going back and forth as would normally be the case. But with trucks and so forth, we want to keep this traffic to a minimum. Uh, we will be using some of our total quality processes and developing timelines, diagrams, I don't think we need a matrix, but we do need the timelines, starting with June 25th when we have to turn both buildings over to the asbestos removal. Um, some of the issues that are listed here we have already taken care of, but it will give you some sense of the degree of detail that we have to go into in order to um, make sure that we are prepared for this and that uh, something as simple as packing things up, putting the boxes where they can be unpacked and kept track of and we're talking about doing this um, in both buildings because we will be removing the asbestos tiles and ceiling and 
steam pipe fittings and so forth at both schools. That does save us money. We will have to put some insulation on pipes back. We will be putting some ceiling tiles back, uh, and we're working on exact costs of that, but even so, it will save us some money. So it's, um, we're getting down to the wire, we hope. <laughs> yes. Bonnie, I had a comment regarding your last page, last paragraph under discussion, yes. just a uh, reference to the throwing out of books. <clears throat> well, we've had some discussion about that. First of all, I should point out that we also talked about desks and so on. There are some old books that have been around a long time that um, in reviewing them, frankly, probably don't have any use. We are talking about ways of using books that are, still have use but do not have uh, curriculum um, appropriateness anymore for whatever reason. Uh, frankly, it's this, dis this group's discussion that led to our uh, Take a Desk program. I hope somebody here took advantage of that. I was surprised at how many people took advantage of it. Saturday morning, it was a steady stream of traffic. Uh, people like, uh, we felt those were desks that uh, we had stored in the high school and because that was, they were in a non-sprinklered place, our new fire chief oh, a year and a half ago, whenever he came on board, required us to take them out of that area and to store them. And um, we went through them at that time and disposed of those who were broken uh, and not repairable. But we still had a number left over. We've used some of them to fill in, but most of them are not appropriate for our curriculum anymore because so many teachers, even at the high school, are dealing with tables and chairs and or desks that can be moved together so that small groups can work together. And most of those were the uh, fairly large desk and attached seat. So we decided, we've tried to sell some of those, um, I think at a Pond Cove uh, fair a couple of years ago. Um, they didn't, well, I think our prices were pretty modest, but they, they aren't really attractive, antique looking desks. They're just kind of desks. And um, they didn't sell. So we decided that after all, they were bought by the townspeople. Why not ask the townspeople if you want a desk? And certainly many children or families can use something that doesn't have to be glamorous or gorgeous, just useful. Uh, so we hope that we've contributed to a study center for a lot of the kids in town, and we appreciate people taking them. And now we have two trailers that we're going to be able to use to store stuff while we are doing our um, you know, renovation project. We'll probably have to rent some more. but. Um, that's all part of the, the domino effect. As far as the books are concerned, one of the things we talked about the other day is for those that really do not have any life left and they really are almost um, is just not really usable unless they're antiques, I don't think we have anything that old, uh, we probably should just plain dispose of them. The uh, books that have some use, I think that they ought to be offered to townspeople. We have looked at offering, we offered some to Litchfield, for instance, the youngsters mentioned Litchfield. We didn't happen to have the right set of books that they were looking for. Um, and there are various other organizations that we have from time to time um, donated books to. But that discussion is still ongoing. If anybody has any ideas about that, we have Well, I, I did. Um, I just wanted to remind people about the book shot over at the transfer station. And if we, you know, put out a few copies of each, you know, on a, instead of dropping a hundred, of the same kind all at once, and I understand that most of these are textbooks. Yep, but they really don't want textbooks there, though, is my understanding from having worked there. Oh. Is that those don't go anywhere, they sit there and oh. then they get well, disposed of. Okay, but they I, really want I, it might be worth a discussion with the recycling committee yeah. people because my understanding is most of those textbooks were college level textbooks and medical professional medical. and accounting and yeah. as opposed to small. Uh, younger age books and I think with from what I've heard for a few years on the board about people wanting supplemental materials and mm -hmm. basal mm -hmm. uh, materials I'll bet you a lot of that Addison Wesley math stuff goes real quickly and I'll take a copy of each grade level please <laughs> and uh, well I think you might find a different and maybe it would be worth calling Joanne Daigle and just having a Is that what small we're discussion about? The Addison Wesley. Um, uh, I'm not sure. I haven't gone over and looked at them myself. And well, I don't know. I, don't know I, just, they, yeah. I was assuming these were really ancient. Uh, I think it's a mixed bag. But I think, I think they belong to the taxpayers of Cape Elizabeth and to the degree that they would be seen as, as um, good supplements of one kind or another. I absolutely agree. 
having moved three times this year, if you have any doubt, <laughs> heave it. <laughs> well, what we now we also have a program going where, um, and I don't know, Sue, if you and Danny figured this out, but uh, we have figured we we're trying to estimate how much storage space the new schools will have, not only in the classroom but also in their various storage um, rooms, and that's the number of boxes teachers are going to be given. A cubic space and uh, so that people who happen to have more stuff in their classroom than will fit into those boxes are going to have some choices to make. I, I think you ought to circulate E.B. White's uh, essay on material yeah. possessions where he describes the things that get on your shelves and in your drawers as kind of a, uh, an occupying army, you know, that digs in like <laughs> the Viet Cong. Yeah. You remember that essay? Yeah. Everybody ought to read that, I think, before a move. Yeah. Yeah. I think they'd have a different attitude. Well, it is actually an opportunity for, um, for you know, it's just one of those things. I, I had a little exercise last summer because the fire chief, again, uh, upon COVID, a non sprinkler building, and he wasn't going to let us open some parts of it unless we could get rid of some stuff. And um, I think that the exercise in pruning um, is helpful, and that's what we hope to do now. Can I just ask one question about mm -hmm. this? If the fourth grade goes to the middle school, are we to we're talking about the far side of the middle school. Mm -hmm. uh, where where would they go to lunch? Would they go to lunch in the middle school? Yes. Well, they would probably like that. <laughs> There's a is, is that going to sweeten there. the pot for a few fourth graders? <laughs> it might. Well, I have a follow-up question to that. Does that mean that they're on the middle school schedule and the middle school buses? Good question. So that's the reason why we have a transition committee, so that we can we can work some things like that. Through. Other question is, does that mean the eighth graders start eating at 10:30 again in the morning? Well, there. Yes, it, it means that anyway. That, that's the recurring. We may find other ways of dealing with this. Our our um, intent is not to impact the programs any more than we we have to. Next year is the year where Pond Cove is scattered. I mean, they'll be in various places. Uh, after that, they'll be back, and it will be the middle school's turn to be scattered. And we do, but, but these discussions are exactly for that purpose, to make sure that we have a handle on those kinds of issues. I just wanted to make a comment about the eighth grade lunch, because next year we do have one of our groups each year has to eat a little early. Um, last year it was the seventh grade. This year it's the sixth grade. And for the 94-95 school year, the eighth grade wins that spot. But that would happen whether the fourth grade ate in our cafeteria or not. They're really not going to impact that. That is part of a result of our effort to give everybody a half hour lunch time so that they really have time to get their food, sit down, and eat it in a reasonable manner. And also for the seventh and eighth graders, when that's really their, their only time that they see all of their friends have a chance to have a little bit of social time as they eat. So the fourth grade really isn't impacting that. That's our effort to get a half hour lunch time for each grade level. And although this isn't on the agenda, uh, may I just make a follow up comment, a question? Nancy, all I would ask you to please keep in mind, and I understand that the reason that we do these things always seems to be the schedule. Um, seventh and eighth graders have after school sports and fifth and sixth graders don't. And many of the seventh and eighth graders do not arrive home until after 4.30 in the afternoon. And I remember when my, uh, one of my children, <laughs> I don't know which one it was, uh, used to try to take food with them in their pockets after having paid for it, Mr. Jewett, um, that uh, would take them from, you know, after school, well, from 10.30 until 4.30. And I just hope that somehow we can uh, make an allowance for that because a 170-pound, uh, five-foot-eight boy who doesn't get home until, and if there's a game or a contest, then uh, we all know it's 5:30 or 6:30 at night. And I just, I remember that very well. It was my son mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, that the students used to complain that they were starved. Sure, and and, and I think that is something that we um, are very aware of. 
Um, one of the things we know that an eighth grader is ready for lunch at 1030 because they're ready to eat almost any time they have an opportunity to. <laughs> we also um, have in their schedule, we have planned instead of a morning break where they might get a snack, they have an afternoon break next year so they can do that. And the other thing is that our parents association helps us out with that by running a snack bar right after school that opens up and specifically for, designed for people who are staying for athletic practices or games, and they try to provide healthy snacks that students will eat, um, and many, many of our students do make use of that snack bar, um, seventh and eighth grade students who are going to practices, as well as anyone else who may be staying after school. So we have tried to put those things in, being very aware of that fact. I, I remember if you'll think back, it was my idea about that snack bar, and I'm glad to see it's going well, but, and not to continue this discussion too much longer, but I just do want you to know that there are some students who, who really do get very, very hungry, and if somehow in that break time they can have the opportunity to actually eat something, um, I just think it would be. <coughs> yeah, I, I think we have work to improve the break time this year, so hopefully that we can address some of those issues. Okay. And uh, simply just noting that uh, we, of course, have met with the town council, tentatively adopted a budget. Our, our understanding is that the, um, whatever happens in the legislature as we speak, the goal is for us to have an operational budget with a zero tax increase. Uh, we are, of course, also adding debt service. Um, more than half of the debt service so that the increase um, will be phased in over two years. I'll just make that note for the record. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, moving on to school board subcommittees and reports. The first is finance subcommittee. Peter. Thank you. Uh, the finance committee met uh, six board members uh, out of seven, and I'm not trying to make the <laughs> feel badly, but it, it was an unusual turnout uh, for a finance committee meeting. We. Uh, we discussed the usual, you know, how this year's budget is going uh, and uh, how the lunch program's going and uh, signed the warrants. But we spent most of the, uh, and incidentally, we, we discussed uh, next year's budget, which is not really cast in concrete yet. Unless somebody heard something today afternoon from Augusta, we still don't know what our state aid is, and it is. Uh, uh, likely that we are, in my opinion anyway, that we are going to make further reductions uh, in our budget. Uh, we're going to be forced to. But that remains to be seen. So we still have that uncertainty hanging over us. But we spent most of the meeting discussing uh, a proposal by Sebago Energy Conservation uh, Corporation to put new lighting in our high school, uh, basically with the objective of uh, putting more efficient lighting in and better lighting. Uh, according to the figures that were presented at the meeting, uh, this would result in a, a saving uh, in electrical consumption of more than a third, uh, which is quite significant, particularly when you consider that we would get uh, better quality of lighting. Uh, this would pay for, this uh, system would pay for itself in about five years. Uh, I think that since there were six school board members there, uh, we uh, don't need another vote. Uh, if everybody's still in favor of it, but uh, but we didn't vote. But we didn't vote. No. Yes, we, we <laughs> do need. Uh, has, has anybody changed their mind? Because I'm about to make a motion. Uh, I don't want to be embarrassed. If uh, uh, so, uh, I would like to make a motion, and it would be that we accept the proposal of Sebago Energy Conservation Corporation for an expenditure. Uh, the total scope of the job is ninety-seven thousand one hundred seventy-five dollars. CMP would give us a rebate of $27,850. So the net cost uh, to us would be $69,325. Uh, we would uh, pay for that uh, in a five-year lease. And at the end of the five years, we would own the, uh, the equipment. Uh, that's my motion. And I include in that motion, by way of reference, uh, the standard uh, language that we have to approve in all uh, leases that we uh, agree to sign. And uh, as I recall the proposal, what we do is we uh, put in our minutes the approval of the 
project that I just described. Time out. We and really need two motions. The, the first motion is to approve the proposal for project, and the second motion would be to approve the proposal for leasing. And that's one where the language would be attached. Good. I amend my motion to uh, be, uh, thank you, that it be two motions. So the first motion will be the project as I described it. Mm -hmm. Second. Any discussion? Mark? Having uh, been working out the 94 Pirates at the time of the Finance Subcommittee, <laughs> <laughs> and being committed to spring training, I unfortunately didn't get all, the entire discussion. One question I have on the portfolio that was or supplied to us is they list several school districts which, for whom they have done work and then two letters of recommendation. None of, I didn't see any data about actual whether their uh, estimates of monies saved has been borne out by those school districts. Has that been addressed? Yes. And, and they have been able to do that? They've been accurate? Can we just follow up on that and find out? Okay. He indicated that they have never had to pay, pay out on their guarantee that they okay. have. They guarantee yeah. this performance. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that answers my question. Trip, uh, thank you. Rosemary. And when you ask for discussion, I would ask that we emphasize that point, please, for the listeners and also for the press. But that we have a guarantee. That we have a guarantee. We will not lose money. That's correct. I, I just, in light of the fact that we're revisiting a five-year-old concept, I think it's important. Okay. I also asked the question if they had exceeded the minimum and they are in the process of studying that, but for, that's a conservative amount. That they guarantee. Anything further? And and the lease is paid out of our savings, our electrolyte savings. That's for the public college. It's not coming out of our operating budget. All in favor? Seven zero. Okay. The second motion will be, uh, as I described it, that we enter into the lease, the five-year lease, and that we approve the standard language and that that be incorporated in the minutes uh, of this meeting. I second that. Any discussion? I have a comment just that that language is provided by our, our legal counsel and has been reviewed. Right. Okay, all in favor? Seven zero. Good. Okay. Moving on to the school building committee. Connie, I think so. Well. The major issue under this one, and we had put the agenda together on Thursday and Thursday night, we have our school building committee. Um, they've, the committee has asked this body to, to look at the issue of whether we should go with gas, natural gas, um, as a fuel of choice for the renovation, um, as well as the high school, or whether we should stay with oil. Um, I did suggest to that body that is a school building committee that I wasn't really sure how in two days time the school board was going to get enough information to make that kind of decision and I've been wrestling with it um, talked to Ann about it to let her know that I was going to have to add that discussion item I have tried or Scott has tried to collect some information uh, some of which uh, frankly we didn't copy because it's sort of um, scattered so I think what I'll try to do is summarize the issue and ask for your, your guidance as to, I mean, I feel that for us as a school board body to try to make that decision without an opportunity to think about what's the best way to make it is, is somewhat troubling to me, but I will try to be as clear as I can. During the school committee uh, building process, it has come up and is part of our minutes that the idea of having gas might be attractive since we're going to have to retrofit and rebuild our heating system. Um, in preliminary discussions with the uh, utility, gas utility company, uh, gas, the gas line is not here in Cape Elizabeth. If we would go with converting all three buildings to gas, they would extend the line at no charge to us. We have not gone far enough in these discussions for me to assure you that there would be no charge whatsoever. They're simply telling us they would extend the line. I don't know if there are any other possible charges, um, but that, that the major cost would be borne by that company. Uh, we have looked at just what it would cost to convert. 
The high school boilers would cost 22,000 to convert to gas. Uh, we have a ga oil tank at the high school that will have to be removed in 1995. That will cost 13,000. So that the, um, wait a second, have I got that right? Yes, that's right, 13,000. So that the actual cost of conversion to gas is a $35,000 piece. If we stay with oil and remove and replace the high school oil tank, that's 34,000 or a total conversion cost of 1,000, almost a wash for all practical purposes. We would still be using the same boilers, but they would be burning gas. There is some question as to whether those boilers would burn gas as efficiently because they're not, we're, they're old boilers or 25 year old boilers and I've heard the question raised. I cannot tell you and I don't have the information um, to really explain whether or not they would that's just the amount of the conversion, um, whether it can be done or not. But anyway, that question was raised. Uh, as far as the cost or savings if, to this project, we have oil tanks that we have to remove anyway, which is a project cost. Um, as far as replacing the tanks, should we stay with oil, that's a $35,000 cost so that there would be a cost saving of 34,000 if we went with gas, just taking those baseline figures. The next thing we tried to look at was, is it cheaper to burn oil or gas? And Scott did get some figures from the gas company based on their estimations of what we're um, using. However, they required follow-up telephone conversations. The figures are not all that clear. There are no real comparisons here but it certainly does appear that gas would be cheaper than oil. Now, one of our problems is that we're now burning number six Bunker C oil, which is very gooey, thick uh, stuff, creates a lot of uh, additional maintenance costs, but is extremely cheap. And when we convert, we will be going to number two oil, which is more expensive. And in fact, we expect a new system to be more fuel efficient but at the same time, we also expect uh, to have far fewer maintenance costs down the line. But as far as, you know, comparing the cost of oil, gas, and, um, you know, the ty type of oil we're burning now, the type of oil we're burning down the line, uh, we don't have a good handle on that. We can tell you that gas is probably cheaper at today's rates, but that's about all for that. Um, We've tried to look at a couple of other issues, for instance, what other schools in the area are using gas. Uh, Bitterford's Middle School, Primary School, Lewiston has one, two, three, four, five schools in that area, including uh, the University of Southern Maine College branch there. Uh, in Portland, Catherine McCauley, Reiki, Wayne Fleet, Westbrook, uh, and the University of Southern Maine in South Portland, SMTC, Westbrook has their high school, Congan School, West, Westbrook Regional Vocational School, uh, the Scarborough School, some of this you know from watching television, um, <laughs> burn gas. There does seem to be something that kind of pops out at you when you look at these lists. Um, some of the area school systems that are burning gas, uh, they have businesses in the area that were already using gas, families that were all using, already using gas, sort of a fair amount of community uh, awareness of gas and using gas. Um, this obviously would be a, a change for this community. Um, and we don't know if that's important or not, but that does has occurred to me in some of our kind of casual conversations. Um, there are some people who are opposed to using gas for a variety of reasons, including I suppose things that have happened recently. Um, and I don't know how much of a problem that is. So trying to summarize this issue. We've done what homework we could. Um, the initial installation is, uh, comes out somewhat in favor of gas, a savings to the project of approximately 34,000. Um, the actual cost of running gas appears to be somewhat cheaper, but we cannot give you an absolute figure on that. Uh, we do not know exactly what the timeline of extending the line would be. Uh, we don't have any timeline on that. And I have to tell you that this is a complicated project. We are still struggling with many timeline issues such as, um, you know, the DEP. We're only 
we have yet to go through our public hearing with the planning board and very likely another meeting there. Um, they don't, I don't think this is a planning board issue as I understand it. It's a local choice of which fuel you use. The burners themselves could be put in uh, at oil but convertible to gas. Um, there are certain, those are the aspects that I know. Um, and I guess I'm looking for some direction. Yes. <laughs> well, Peter, we agreed last month. <laughs> um, I would just caution uh, members of the board who may not be cognizant of the um, fear and terror. I don't think that's an exaggeration. Um, of many of the people who lived in the Cottage Farms Road area uh, in 1990 when that house, thank God, no one was home, uh, blew up because of a gas line that had been improperly uh, terminated. Um, and I just think that there are many people who think the um, uh, $34,000 of potential savings that we can currently document uh, would not be worth that risk, uh, whether it be real or imagined. Uh, I would perceive it as uh, the number one point of discussion. The other thing uh, that I would like to point out, and uh, that is that uh, right now there is no competition for northern utilities. That's my understanding. I think it's regulated, though, isn't it? I believe it's regulated, but my, my concern about the oil uh, or my favoritism towards the oil is the fact that we do have a competitive process. Uh, it is very well regarded. Um, Connie, I do wanna, want to add emphasis to the fact that you said that people out, we don't have a gas line. Uh, it's another complication to a very complicated <coughs> project. I was very relieved to finish <coughs> reading the article in the Cape Courier about the architecture, the um, archaeological find and find out it was in fact an April Fool's hoax, <laughs> but quite frankly, <laughs> uh, my first comment was, well, why am I reading it in the Courier? Why didn't I find out sooner? Uh, but we just, that. yeah. <laughs> I felt the, for it too. <laughs> but the, uh, the bottom line is uh, we do not have a very good history of being able to make uh, an effortless transition uh, in these buildings. And I just think any complication that we add or any unknown variable that we add to the mix, uh, I just, I mean, it's gonna be your headache, not mine, but those are, <laughs> those are my comments for their value. It's bad for us what's going on, I know. I'll watch. <laughs> Carla, I'd just like to know from someone who maybe knows more about it than I do, not financial, what's an advantage of gas? Well, um, we, there was a discussion at the building committee, and in fact, they did take a vote uh, of the members present. Um, let's see, there were seven members present, five voted for gas, um, one no, and one abstention. Um, when I asked for a, um, that was a, I had asked for a recommendation. I, I really felt kind of not on real firm ground coming to this body with to make that decision. Um, the person, one of the uh, members of the committee uh, pointed to the environmental issues that supposedly, uh, as I understand it, and I certainly am not telling you out of my own knowledge, that gas is a um, in cleaner burning mm -hmm. and that they're, one of the things that gas companies do cite is that there may be future regulations on oil burning um, apparatus that we will be dealing with. And of course, replacement of tanks has become expensive. And although I understand that from our conversation again at the committee meeting about uh, new tanks, they have a much longer, supposedly much longer life than the old ones did and so forth. But the environmental issues, I guess. Well, I think there are two more. Uh, it's plentiful and it's on this continent. Hmm. There, there was another issue that was also brought up about um, the schools to some, some degree doing something for the community and bringing in converting our, our campus to a all gas burning system would bring a line into the Pond Cove area and there are merchants in that shopping center <coughs> who have very high energy costs who could benefit from a line being brought in. So that was, a, that was also um, a consideration brought in, not so much to sway the, to sway the body but to but would the school the department be paying for the line to be brought in? No. Mm -hmm. That would be a town? That would, no, it would be provided by Northern Utility. Oh, okay. But only if we convert the high school. 
They will not bring it in for the project. Uh, having lived in the Midwest and the West Coast, burning oil is kind of an East Coast thing to, to a large extent. And there is no fear of gas because everybody lives in gas heated homes and gas heated buildings and it's a very, very safe product and I would agree with Peter's input. It's basically uh, just all around cleaner, cheaper and has a, a very steady, reliable source in the United States and that would be my preference. I was just going to say, having sat at the building committee meeting, there was no overwhelming huge desire for the gas, but it was the general consensus that probably gas was the cleaner, um, better way to go. The architects refused to really sway the discussion one way or the other. They really felt that their engineers and everybody said it was a real balance um, and it was a real choice. And the discussion was brought up, Rosemary, about the house in Cape Elizabeth. But it also is clear that many people in Cape Elizabeth have lived other places and have lived in homes with, uh, with natural gas and, you know, that their disasters could come either way. Um, so that was certainly recognized um, as, a, as unique to this town. Um, but uh, I, I guess I would support the gas. Well, I'll just say candidly that I was not at the meeting on <laughs> Thursday. And um, I always knew if I didn't go to a meeting, there would be some special way I would have to admit that. Um, but I, to be perfectly honest, I really don't feel that this is the school um, school board's decision to be making. I think this is putting us in an unfair position. Um, I don't feel, you know, Connie said the information that we have. I remember two months ago when we were really discussing this, I, I remember personally asking for more concrete information. I don't feel, I think we're, you know, we're going to sit here and make this decision, you know, emotionally or on, you know, what we're used to in the past. And I grew up in a house with gas, so it doesn't bother me personally either. But, you know, I'm not sure we're, we're going to be making, you know, a real business-like decision here. And I really think it was, um, it's the building, no. the building committee's uh, Can I comment decision on that? to make. The why it becomes a school board issue is because in order to bring the gas in, we have to convert the high school. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's a cost, a cost to the building project for the line. That's why it's a school board decision. So if the school board chooses not to convert the high school, then it does not become an option for the building but, committee. But I'm just saying, I don't feel like we have all the information that you know, would make this a real good decision that we could all feel. Uh, well, I, I think if, uh, I, I do have some background in this, uh, uh, having uh, converted a number of, uh, you know, heavy uh, rust belt industries, if you will, uh, you know, having dealt with old boilers, 1911, 1920, 1932, you know, uh, and I mean, basically, even though we had staff on this uh, company, you know, from the very top working on this issue, uh, you, we really had to end up hiring an energy consultant, of which there are plenty, to, to analyze oil, gas, uh, you know, wood chips, uh, pulverized coal. Uh, I mean, there's just a lot of different alternatives and a lot of different options. And you certainly don't want to get locked in to uh, gas burning no matter what. At least that would be my initial reaction. I wouldn't want to do that without somebody having told me why that's a good idea. So it would seem to me that uh, we would, the building committee or the school board, would just have to commission a, a fairly quick study of this. I don't believe it would be very expensive. Uh, and uh, I don't think you could make the decision without, without doing that, frankly. That's, uh, that's what I thought. <laughs> So. Well, I certainly I did feel like I had the no. information. Um, that's, I, I think I was just trying to, uh, ever since this has happened, I've had to sort of figure out how to add the discussion. We haven't even, didn't get it in time to add to the agenda. I'm simply bringing this up as part of the report in the school building committee so that we don't have any way of giving notice to the public that we are truly discussing this. I would therefore feel uncomfortable advising you to take a vote on it under those circumstances. This certainly gives us some sort of, um, gives me some sense of, of what might be uh, a way to deal with this. And then we can certainly uh, investigate, uh, work with the architects and investigate or, through our own sources a, an energy 
consultant to, to because what the information we have frankly doesn't isn't readable um, certainly not to the layperson and I think that uh, if there is some way of factoring in the emotional factor I just think it has to be considered well I think I think this discussion is valuable for that people will will hear it I'm sure we'll hear from people if, if it's mm -hmm. on their minds but I, I do feel like we need some more information okay. to make this make this decision Charlie. it would also be interesting to know and I think you could get that from northern utilities what number of homes in this community use gas mm -hmm. I know in the northern part along the shore area Oakhurst there's a there is a lot of use of gas, whether it's gas stoves or gas. Yeah, there's some. It's some, spot. but it would be interesting to know. It would. I, m I must say, I mean, they may end up being our, our our source, and I don't really want to badmouth them, but I know we have gotten only minimal information from them, and not always in a timely manner. And that's one mm. thing that makes me hesitant about this decision. Well, one uh, one. I'd like to make one minor observation. I have no idea whether it's significant or not, but at least once or week or once every 10 days, I see our high school chimney emitting the blackest, thickest smoke. It's every Tuesday, Peter. Is it every Tuesday? Why Because the that? transfer station is closed. So they're burning. We have an incinerator it's at not the, the high number school. six oil. No. Mm -hmm. So they're using it as an incinerator. Because there is no trash. Uh, there's no way to dispose of the garbage from the lunch program, to be blunt and the other trash that is accumulated during the day. So the buildings, all three buildings are picked up and brought to the high school where it is the, the trash is then incinerated. Okay, so it's not, uh, it's not the number six oil. We have a, a first rate boiler down there right now. Well, <laughs> first rate. <laughs> we have Anybody boilers that have been undergoing quite a lot of repair. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. I don't know if that makes them first rate or not. The smoking is, is uh, of course, having spent part of my life in New York, where you, you know, incinerate trash, I'm used to that black smoke. But also, that heavy black smoke can be a malfunctioning. Yeah, I think oil. at this point, though, I think that is a it's mostly that it is okay. the incinerator. You just have to watch a baseball game and ask the question of the right person to know that answer for a school board meeting. <laughs> I asked that two years ago. That must have been a meeting I missed. No, no. I mean, I was oh, watching a baseball game and I asked oh, okay. Bob Bennett why that black smoke and I mentioned it to Sue Weatherby as well. There you go. Thank you. Now I, I saw it within the last couple of weeks. Definitely. And Well, I know, I know they have been <laughs> okay. undergoing repairs on again, off again, all year. Well, do you feel like you have yes. a sense of the board? Would I do. you like to have a rosemary? Can't we make a motion to authorize the superintendent to commission a study? And that way, um, if we're not going to have a meeting in time for the information to get back to the building committee, it is okay. part of their record. Permanent. Yeah. Um, my question is, at whose expense <laughs> the study be undertaken um, I well what I will do I, is try so to you can't can't we just recommend that this that it say the school board would like the building committee to um, look into this further because we don't have enough information to make a firm decision so moved I don't want to be on the uh, hook for that one. no um, well I'll make that motion okay that oh I forgot okay that we ask the uh, building committee to commission a study to investigate they don't, they don't the commission. They don't commission. To undertake further study. Undertake, undertake, undertake further, further study, study of the issue of natural gas versus oil consumption. Well, I think it probably ought to be refined a little bit more because I think that we, uh, if, we didn't rule anything out, in other words. There wasn't a majority <coughs> against natural gas. If there was a majority against natural gas on this board as of this moment, you probably wouldn't do the study. Correct. Uh, I think one has right. to communicate to whoever's doing the study a, a mandate that, uh, that the school board was open-minded to the most uh, safe, environmentally sound, and economically feasible uh, alternative, but it simply had to be 
shown which one it was, or the building committee had to be have some idea of what those trade-offs are. In other words, I, I think you've got to send them in there so they have a they approach it from the point of view of a blank slate. And we've also been given an estimate of what conversion of the high school would be. I think we actually, considering the age of those boilers and that system, I think we actually need to have some more concrete figures because we could be committing our own operating budget to considerably more than what appears to be a, essentially a wash. Okay. And also we have to be looking down the line. We may have to replace those boilers anyway if, we, if they've undergone extensive repairs this year. Boilers are probably fine. Boilers have a long the life. Burners. It's the various, yeah, yeah. that's exactly right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> can I just clarify where we are? Do we have a motion <laughs> on, on the table or not? Are, are you sticking with your motion? Or? No, I, I'll, I'll remove it. I mean, it was not why seconded. It was. Why don't we remove your motion? And Peter can. Make a comment and then we can have that. Okay. My comment Any is sort motion. of an expansion on what Peter said the board consensus on what we want to know from the building committee. If I was to be asked this instant, it's more of a, from my point of view, because of my knowledge base, I would go in there saying, prove to me why I should want gas. That would be the stance that I am approaching it at if you're going to try and give them an idea. I don't want them to think that it's basically a lot of people leaning towards gas, but give us the figures anyway. Okay, I think what, what I would like to do is we take a straw poll and we, train, and we have the motion about we'd like further study and that should give them the, the information that they need. So this, is, this would be a poll? Uh, Individual just poll. Of, yeah, just so we I, see, I see because. See, I think it's important how you take the poll. We ought to discuss that a little bit. I'm not opposed to gas and I'm not opposed to oil either. And so I don't want to vote gas no, versus no, oil no, no. <laughs> why don't why don't <laughs> i knew this wasn't going we to went, be easy we went, <laughs> we went did we say an hour meeting this we went through this committee. exercise at the building committee and we eventually came down to just getting a consensus and the consensus was we went person by person how they how they felt and what the issues were to them and that's essentially what we did okay I like to start there, yeah. please. That's, that's what I would <laughs> I'll start. I did it, I did it in the building committee. Um, I guess I would lean towards gas. Um, I'm not afraid of it. I grew up with it. Um, and it's cleaner. And Charlie made a point at the building committee. I don't want to steal it. But we are teaching these kids to um, grow up in a clean environment and do what's best. And um, I think that's important. And it is a, um, something available on this continent. We're not dependent. And I'll build on what uh, Beth said in the fact that I think we also are extending a service to our community by extending, having that line extended for the whatever business element that we have. And there are businesses in the Pond Cove um, Center that could benefit from gas. I would also be leaning towards gas, but I want to know what the, all the costs are, the long-term costs. That's something we operate too often without. So it's I lean to gas for the same reason. Reasons. Yes. <laughs> um, I want to remain open-minded and learn the facts about both as much as possible, financial and otherwise. Um, I have a parochial bias towards oil, but I'm willing to be very open-minded towards gas. Um, however, I, I do admit to a half percent of emotionalism having lived a very close to the house that blew up. And I know statistically, I know that intellectually, but it's there, I saw it. Well, I saw it too. And uh, I would uh, say we really need to study this a lot for me to vote for gas. Thank you. Okay, now a motion. We still. That was E M. <laughs> Peter, is it? Do you, am I making a like, motion? Would you like to? It's, you framed it. You framed it well. Okay. Let me. This is a motion that we bounce it back to the building committee for a study. Right. Because we expect <laughs> that to make the decision. I move we bounce it back to the building committee for a study. No. Uh, <laughs> that's what we're doing. Correct. That's what we're doing. Okay. Uh, I, I move we. Uh, 
communicate to the, uh, to the building committee uh, the results of this straw poll for their guidance uh, and our unanimous view that a, uh, a technical study should be made by somebody with expertise in this field uh, so that uh, all of us can make an informed decision. Second. Mark, any discussion? No. All in favor? 7-0. Thank goodness that's a Mark. Mark. Well, I certainly, <laughs> okay. <laughs> the bill, I, as a member of the building committee, but <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just funny. It's not, it's not a funny issue, but it's just a funny scenario that's bouncing all about the heating system. But. Well, I think I certainly, I have some guidance and I will proceed. <laughs> Thank you. I, I will tell you all, just to tell you how difficult this is uh, and what this has been lurking in the back of my mind. Uh, you all, those of you who are old enough, remember 1974 when everybody said the world was going to run out of oil? Mm -hmm. In 1978, the Stanford Research Institute spent a lot of money uh, hiring seven gurus to tell us what the oil future and the energy future of the planet was. And I stumbled across that book in about 1982. And I read these seven scenarios, you know, written by the Rand Corporation and by MIT and by, by other luminaries, uh, both groups and individuals. And what stuck in my mind was not one of them predicted that by the year 1990, the price of oil would be less than $100 a barrel. Mm. It's 15 today. Some of these considerations on, you know, it's plentiful, it's on this continent, it's cheap. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Well, we will we see. We can at least make an informed decision. It's okay. On the information we have before us today. Um, are we moving on to calendar committee now? <laughs> okay. Connie, would you like to yeah. take you, that? What you have in front of you is a draft copy. Um, I put some information in your agenda notes about this. Let me just review the process. You know that um, I don't expect you to vote on this tonight, that we'll be voting on it in May, that after our discussion tonight, we will go back and administratively make any adjustments. Um, and uh, also, of course, this is an advice and consent with the Teachers Association, and I will certainly pass it over to their executive committee, but also informally the uh, administrators are talking to teachers in the building so that we have some sense of how their, their reaction. Having said as much, uh, frankly, it's not a very complicated calendar because we're going to have so many complications uh, with building projects. We're not trying to do anything different from what we normally do. We have a couple of issues I'd like to call your attention to, some of which um, actually came after I did the agenda notes, so I'll point it out. Uh, we are suggesting using two of the five teacher workshop days uh, to precede the start of school, the 1st of September and the 6th of September. Uh, now, it is possible that the high school, which is not necessarily, they will be impacted to some degree by the activity going on um, in the rest of the um, school district, but it is conceivable that they would want to use that day at another time in the year. We had one day this, this calendar that we did that. Uh, the reason, obviously, for having the two faculty days is to use at least one of them to get the staff back in and help them, give them time to set up their rooms and so forth. Um, the timeline that we have right now for the asbestos removal does not guarantee turning all of the buildings back to us until September 1st. However, they'll be turning the buildings back to us gradually, Pine Cove, well before that time in some of the middle school before that time, but they, there is going to be a tight schedule no matter what we do. So that's our suggestion that we take that into consideration and um, uh, at least for Pond Cove and uh, middle school, uh, presumably the high school can use that time too, but that's something we need to, um, it, it's open for negotiation if you wish. Uh, we don't want to start school until faculty day the 6th and Wednesday the first day of school. A um, couple of reasons for that. Uh, obviously, if we're not getting the buildings back until the first, it's going to take every bit of our energy and inside personnel, our custodial people, and so forth, 
to make sure that we've got things back in place. So I don't think we would uh, be, it would not be possible for us to start school any sooner as far as bringing in students. It does also, I should point out, we have a policy about trying to avoid major tests for um, certain religious holidays, one of which uh, actually falls on the uh, 7th and 8th. Um, six and, and seven. Excuse me, 6th and 7th. Uh, so that we do have some ability to uh, respect that policy, uh, if not totally, at least we have made some adjustments for it. Uh, moving on for the rest of the calendar, there are three more staff development days, and we do have, we've marked the 27th as a half day workshop and the 28th for fall conferences. Now that doesn't fall at the end of a quarter. Um, our thought was to try to have uh, our continuing effort to rethink how we reach out to elementary. We are talking about doing conferences somewhat differently, meeting parents at the end of the summer or early in the school year. And some of that, of course, won't be a formal workshop day. We did have a half workshop day this year. Uh, I realized that there was some discussion at the board level about that this year, and you may have some feelings about that this year, but we put it in as it was in this year. Um, moving on, we think that since we're having a fairly late start, and Lordy knows what the weather will be like, that um, Christmas vacation uh, or December vacation will probably be best to be kept short. So we're uh, indicating school going through the 23rd and coming back on January 3rd. Now it's been interesting, I've been watching some of the calendars in the paper and I have talked to people at Maine School Management on this one. The second, as I understand it, is going to be the official holiday for New Year's Day. Mm. Uh, some school calendars are, are bringing, or at least indicating, that that's going to be a day of school. Now, it can't be a day of school unless the board literally overrides the holiday. You have even, for instance, in our contracts for hourly workers, we have this listed as a holiday. I see nothing practical to be gained by bringing people in on that day, especially since we are planning on going through the 23rd. Um, and I've been getting some mixed information from people about that, but I think if we don't mark that as a holiday, we're gonna have to anyway um, down the line, so I suggest marking. And then we have two other teacher workshop days listed, one April 7th and one May 26th. That's about it. Rosemary? Um, just for people looking at this, Connie, on um, September 2nd, could we put the two hash marks through there that say no school so that when people look at that, they oh, indicate yeah. it's just a... Um, and I just had a comment about December 23rd. Uh, since we're scheduled to get out of school on the 12th, um, excluding snow days and high school graduation on the 9th, um, would it be possible to consider having no school on December the 23rd since that'll probably be an extremely high absentee day? Well, and you certainly can do anything you want to with it. Well, uh, well, I just, just thought, I mean, I think you'll find that people are not in school on the 23rd. Um, when it's that close to the holidays. And uh, perhaps move the last day of school to the 13th on a Tuesday. I've always thought about hanging that half day on Monday where you, all you come back for is to uh, get your report cards and. Except this year at Pond Cove, you won't get your report card that day. It'll be mailed so no one would go. And oh, under that, well. that scenario. <laughs> so I, I agree with you that. I'll let you make that statement. Out yeah. there. And you're probably right about the 23rd though you hear parents say they want their kids in as long as possible if they're not traveling. But I, I think okay. that's a, a good trade-off. Carl, I just want to um, sort of just do a public statement, not to belabor the religious holiday because this is a very satisfactory compromise with all the um, other factors involved. But I do just want to make people aware that there is still a certain percentage of students who will miss the first day of school. And there is a certain percentage of faculty who will miss their faculty day and some who will also miss the first day of school. This is Rosh Hashanah? Yes, this is Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is the seventh? The sixth and the seventh. Sixth and the seventh. But there are some people um, who will observe only the sixth. There are others who will observe both days. Right. I should think in that okay. case we would open a day later. 
This is what we find is a practice in the area schools. Some are not um, doing that. This is what Portland is and doing, we, I believe. We, this is an issue, um, not only for Rosh Hashanah, but for other days mm -hmm. like Good Friday, where mm -hmm. um, some children do not attend school. And I think we have to be careful. I think a compromise is good, and where we can be sensitive, um, I think we should. And I, and I think we're recognizing that. But we've, we've got a lot of pressure in a lot of ways for not to have old school on certain days. And yeah, I, I was thinking that the first day of school falling on a religious holiday was a particularly unfortunate uh, outcome. In other words, Good Friday, uh, Yom Kippur doesn't fall on, don't fall on uh, the first day of school, they fall on regular school days. So that would be my. Rosemary. Well, I, I, I would probably have to add to the discussion that um, with all due respect to the religious holiday aspect in our current policy, um, we could honor the religious holiday and also give ourselves um, some time that we may or may not need um, by starting school a day later. And I'm, I'm still going to go back to, I mean, getting out of school even on the 13th uh, is still early or the 18th. And if we have an opportunity in, you know, 10 years to honor uh, a tradition that we have a policy stating that we will to the extent that we can, then I think we ought to at least consider it. Carl? I just want to say I think it would be great if people are um, even willing to consider the eighth. It was one thing that I mentioned early in my discussions, and I frankly never thought I had a chance of getting people to consider that. Well, you have to ask. I, was kind of <laughs> I said, what is Portland doing? I mean, I, my general rule of thumb is, let's see what the how area schools are working that out. Um, there are some issues, for instance, about, oh, there are some interlocking issues here. I don't know how many students we have going to, of course, we don't have many going to the vocational school, do we, Rick? Hmm? About 12. About 12? Um, I think this, I th you're not taking a vote tonight, and I think this gives us a chance. I mean, I assume that we would be doing in this area what the majority of the school districts who are, who have policies like this and who are, are, are dealing with it. You will find that many districts are starting before Labor Day, so that yeah. that was an issue. Um, I don't want to, in any sense, do anything but just point out the various pieces you need to be aware of, uh, and we can, um, we can certainly continue our discussion with the school districts and see what some kind of consensus. I have not yet heard of a school district in the area that is not starting school until um, the 8th. And I think there is then an issue that you bring in about um, when the teacher days are. Do you, do you have a teacher day on the 8th then and start school on Friday the 9th? They do need that day. I was, my comments were really directed at the uh, students attending, understanding that the staff are making their own decisions and can get the information other ways than being present at the uh, teacher orientation and things of that nature. Um, Connie, when we have money in the budget for those orientation sessions before Pond Cove starts. There is um, money. Being thought, so. uh, well, I'm not sure. Uh, obviously, the exact nature of getting Ponco back together, but we, we anticipate getting Ponco back from the asbestos abatement problems uh, sooner than we do the middle school. So uh, I'm assuming that we can manage that, whether it would be, um, I, I think we're also going to probably give some discretion to the teams. I know, Beth, we've had some quick conversations about that. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be all on the same day. Right. But it, it's, it's thought to be before this calendar starts, probably, maybe the last week in I August. Think I'm, I'm just, I don't, I'm not looking for exact dates, just when people are thinking of doing that, if you know yet. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of your question. When those orientations for, in, for, for the incoming grades are planned, are those planned for maybe during the last week of August? I think it would be dependent upon when the spaces are available, but tentatively, yes, okay. I'd say that. All right. 
Oops. And I just wanted to comment, um, having noticed that Scarborough did away with all their half days this year, um, finding that they weren't really productive for teachers or for students. Um, and they went to actually for a week-long Thanksgiving break, I think, incorporating a lot of teacher days. But it's interesting that they have also done away with half days. Yes, I must say that um, this calendar is certainly cleaner than it was <laughs> a, just a few short years ago. So we'll continue to discuss. Okay, I, if I hear you correctly, you would, you're, as a board, you were open to uh, continuing exploration about the actual start of calendar. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I, it's impossible to predict winter, but if we take the 23rd and the last day of school becomes the 13th, that gives three snow days and before you run into the very problem that I think yeah. is the next item on our, or practically our next item, which is adjusting our this year's calendar for the last day of school. And I just, just want to point mm -hmm. that out so that people are aware of it. Yeah. Um, and we will continue to find out what the, um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so that's correct. Just for any direction, I would, um, I am certainly sympathize with um, the children who would miss the first day of school, but I would hesitate to have our kids out to the 8th or the 9th in September. It, it is a long time, especially when other schools are going back August 30th, Scarborough mm -hmm. is. And I also have the same reservations. September can be a very productive month for kids, especially if we get them back and get them started right. Well, I'll continue to try to see what other area schools are doing because I think it is an area issue and, and we can continue. Well, okay. Just, I, but other area schools are not doing the construction. No, I know, but I think we've. Okay, I just. Taken, I think that's been taken into account. So. All right. I mean, let's be cl let's be clear about why we're doing it. If we're if we make that decision, I don't think it's construction related. Well, I, for me, it's part of my. Carla, um, I think that one of the systems we should um, double check with is Portland, who had indicated a start of the seventh, but was still waffling on the eighth. Okay, we do that. And I, I really think that Portland has more of a bearing because we are interconnected with the PVRTC, and we do have students that attend that. Mm -hmm. and okay, anything else? Okay, moving on to the policy subcommittee meeting. Rosemary. <coughs> I forgot I was up. Uh, we did have a meeting, um, and we, uh, the full committee met with the superintendent, and we basically went over uh, administrative procedures. Uh, we spent uh, an extensive um, amount of time on the placement procedures um, for Pond Cove and also an overview of the uh, redesign or re-engineer, uh, which is the um, long-term focus of why it is we have policies and trying to make our schools run better and uh, have our students uh, more productive learners while they're there, as well as uh, upholding state and federal mandates and laws. And basically, um, the policy chair left uh, after two hours and the discussion continued, so I would defer to anyone who remained uh, to say what happened through the rest of the meeting. <laughs> Rosemary, you got the gist of it. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Uh, we adopted okay. no, no policies. No policies to bring forward. Okay. Okay, moving on to unfinished business. The first is Pine Cove placement procedures. I think by this point, um, everybody certainly on the board is aware of those proposed changes, um, and there is at this point some ongoing work at the at Pond Cove to just really to pick up on what Rosemary was just saying. The, the point of changing the, the placement procedures is certainly not just to change placement. It is to look at issues that are troubling to both parents and staff in the sense of looking for how, how do we have 
some kind of quality assurance across grade level? What kind of curriculum are we using as a core curriculum with some flexibility surrounding it? Um, tomorrow morning, beginning at quarter of eight, the entire staff at Pankova is meeting with Jim Curry. Uh, earlier uh, in the month, the middle school staff met with Jim Curry. This is a, so I mentioned it during the budget process, we have monies for staff development in something called differentiated curriculum. We're really excited about this because we see this as an opportunity for um, all classrooms, no matter uh, the exact background or interests or strengths of the individual teacher to learn or to expand upon what they already know about making curriculum reach, stretch for some kids, fill in for others. Um, he's done an impressive amount of work in the last few years. Jim Curry came to the area from seven or eight years ago. He was actually hired by USM as their, uh, frankly, their gifted and talented professor. I mean, <laughs> professor of the study of gifted and talented programs, I should say. I'm sure there are many gifted and talented professors <laughs> at USM. But in fact, the um, work that he has more and more been doing with school systems is working with teachers to take a core curriculum and make it uh, adjusted in various ways for individual students. So we, we think that's a very practical way for us to reinforce and support staff's ability to make this placement change work. Uh, there will be other issues, we just mentioned another one, the idea of trying to open up various kinds of feedback loops with our parents. Um, we have sent out written material, there's samples of it in your packet. And frankly, I don't have any anything new to add to this, just to, uh, I wanted to, um, in case anybody uh, had questions, to make it um, something that you could comment on or ask about. Since this, Charlie. since this letter just went out on April 8th and this is only April 12th, has there been any kind of feedback? <laughs> there actually has, Charlie. Um, Barbara McLean and Mary Ann Brown made some phone calls last night. We thought we would be able to reach about 50 parents, but they spent probably well over two hours on the phone. I think they talked with perhaps over 30, just getting feedback on, first of all, the progress report, what parents' thoughts were about that, um, the, uh, the conference itself, and we have some, some feedback that I just have, I will put that together and put that into a, a written format um, for you. Um, one of the things that's come back in regard to conferences is that the, 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 the way that it was accomplished this time, this spring, um, didn't allow for conferences with all of the parents. It, it necessitated conferences with some and didn't allow for all parents to have an opportunity to meet with, with the teacher. In talking with the teachers this afternoon at the, uh, at the team meeting, I think that they were feeling that there wasn't an opportunity, especially I think at K1 and 2, and I think to some degree at 3 and 4, there wasn't an opportunity for closure with parents. We talked at the very, um, at the very end of the team meeting today about the possibility of taking the day in the fall, or taking one day in the fall and two days in the spring, um, and give, giving folks that opportunity to, to have that closure. And that likewise, I think, has been the feeling of the, the feedback that we did get back from parents. I think that there is um, a very strong um, consensus about the fact that uh, we're not dealing with teacher or with placement issues at conferences. I think that that uh, has been very positive, both in regard to parent feedback and teacher feedback. Um, we have gotten some feedback from parents as, or from teachers as well, and I'd be happy to put that in a written form. But um, one of the things that I think that again has come back clearly is the need to address uh, consistency in the curriculum. And that, that continues. Mm. But we'll, I think we can put together um, some more, some figures and some more information uh, in that regard. But that's just a brief. Okay. One of the problems that we faced this year was uh, how to make changes without making parents feel that there's something been taken away. Um, and perhaps under the circumstances, that's been inevitable. 
It is not our intention, however, for that to be um, a feeling that is ongoing. I think that is very possible. In fact, I think it is absolutely our intent to uh, rethink and redevelop ways in which we communicate so that it actually the sum total of this will be uh, better communication uh, because there certainly was some uh, downside to squishing in the conferences in the one day or even the day and a half. Uh, so that will be an ongoing issue, but I, and I too have had some feedback where people, no matter what we did, we were going to communicate a sense of something somehow being taken away, and it is going to be important for us to replace that in positive and clear ways so that that will not be the feeling as we finish out next year. Yeah, that's absolutely right, and actually we really started this discussion when we started talking about the calendar last year, and at that point we said we really have to re-examine how we give parents information, we need to re-examine conference time, and I, I just want to stress right now, let's start that process now for how we deliver the, the um, information that parents want in a way that is meaningful when parents need it and not necessarily only in a one day or day and a half two times a year. I think that's the critical thing we need to work at and it's going to take some time um, and effort on a lot of people's part to, to make that work. So, Beth? One of the issues that um, has been, was brought to our attention was that by teachers that, that there were situations where parents didn't keep the conference times because it was, had occurred on a Friday. And people viewed it, some people viewed it as a long weekend. And, uh, you know, that's, it's something that I think that we need to look at, to consider, to talk about the seriousness of, of uh, using that time wisely. Well, we had one thing we had talked about um, at some length was a way to give release time to teachers to meet with parents at times which were also convenient to parents and not mm -hmm. just on that set day. And I think we need to continue to explore that. There are a lot of parents who want to meet, meet very early in the morning or might want to meet in the evening or some other time besides that one, that one day. So I think we need to explore that creatively. I'd like to add emphasis to that, Beth. There are more and more people who work all day Friday right. who really aren't seeing it as a long weekend. Um, I've had more and more parents ask about, well, why can't we meet after 5.30 and, you know, why can't the teachers have time off during the day so that they can meet with us at night? Um, I am very familiar with the Portland School System's um, parent-teacher conferencing, uh, which is required, uh, and this is through the secondary level, and we meet uh, at assigned times in the evening. We do not have an opportunity during the day. It's in the evening. And the teachers are given uh, release time the week of Thanksgiving to uh, make up for the time spent at the night. Uh, and I think that there was about an 80%. Uh, it was a very high, much higher than they got uh, when they did it the other way, uh, turnout of parents. That was an issue. I mean, I think that that's more and more an issue, that there are working parents, and it's not necessarily convenient. Um, and I think we do need to, to look at that. I think there are a variety of ways to do it. I think your point's well taken, in that if the, if the communication is constant, if it's continuous in a variety of different ways, that that will diminish the, uh, you know, the impact of that. Any other comments? Okay. Moving on to the last day of school. It sounds like a movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, you are certainly, I know, everybody is aware that we've had five snow days, and one of the nice things about this week is that I looked at the whole week, and you know, we're not going to have another snow day. <laughs> it's definitely not going to be a problem. Two years ago, we had a snow day um, the day before April vacation. Right. Not all of you remember that, but I do. I do. I do. Um, anyway, uh, this winter is gone. To make up for the fact that right now the last day of school is the 20th of June, a Monday, our proposal is that we look at the 27th of May, which is listed as a teacher workshop day. Uh, my proposal or our proposal administratively to you is to turn that into a student half day, workshop day. The reason we want to make it a workshop day is that we've already uh, contracted with some staff development uh, materials or people and we don't want to lose the opportunity to do the staff development that we planned for those days. We obviously have to 
shrink it some, but we, we can still accomplish most of our goals. And we can count it as a teacher pupil day if it's a workshop day. So our proposal is workshop day on the 27th, which would mean that the last student day would be the 17th, the Friday, and a teacher day um, in lieu of the 27th on June 20th. Does that mean, Connie, that the 17th is a half day or a full day? Uh, well, we usually have some uh, shrinkage of that day, don't we? I mean, it's certainly not a full day of school. We, I know that each school has different activities, but whatever they normally are would be on the 17th. Connie, you're asking that the 27th become a half day for That's pupils. That's correct. That's it. Want a motion? Yep. I so move. Second. Second. Any discussion? Except that I hate half days. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. Under these circumstances. <laughs> but, look, but look at next year's schedule. Mm -hmm. yeah. What you've done in two years. I know. <laughs> All in favor? Uh, did you have a comment? No. no. Sorry. Okay. All in favor? 7 0. Thank you. So I assume we'll be sending home notices to parents to make sure that they, you know, that's mm. understood and so on. Okay, the next item is new business. Discussion of proposed changes in middle school administrative procedures, middle school trimester proposal. So, Well, I don't think I'm anywhere near as to, uh, prepared to discuss that as Nancy would be, so. I think in your packet um, you all received a memo explaining pretty much exactly why we are making this proposal and some of the things we have done to talk with parents about that in the middle school. I've mentioned it at least once if not twice at our Tuesday morning um, middle school parents association executive board meetings and it has received favorable response. I've talked about it several times throughout the year informally with a few board members and also with other parents as they've come into the middle school and we've talked about other issues. And then in our March newsletter, I wrote about that I was gonna make this proposal or um, bring it to the board's attention and invited parents to call with input. As I wrote in my memo, not very many parents called in or saw me or spoke to me about it, but those that did were all very um, positive about the change. And pretty much, as the memo says, we'd like to make the change because it would bring consistency to our marking terms for our academic subjects and our allied arts subjects. This is the first year all of our allied arts have been on a trimester. Last year, we piloted in the seventh grade. And the reason we did that is because it gave a more consistent time period and a longer time period to especially the computer technology, library, and our art classes. And they meet approximately, I think it's about 30 times, and in our six-day rotation, they meet three of those days, and you take one of them for each trimester. The library in fifth takes, occurs for fifth graders in place of technology. And um, that has worked very positively for the Allied Arts team. Um, it's not 100%, but it's much better than the approach with the quarter approach, which broke things up um, very, very much for them. Now, what this has done is it's resulted in this piece of confusion for parents, students, and teachers about, okay, this is the quarter, this is the trimester, when do we get report cards, those kinds of things. So what we began to talk about with parents this year is really, well, what if we had everything on a trimester? and we had a longer amount of time, what we're really going from is you figure we usually have about 36 weeks of school. In a quarter, you have nine weeks for each quarter. With the trimester, it would be a 12-week period, and it would give longer time for units of study and for students to get to know teachers and for teachers to get to know students. We would certainly still continue. In the middle school, everybody gets a progress report halfway through whatever the unit of grading is and uh, they would still get three progress reports and they would get three report cards. We would still encourage parents and teachers to communicate with one, other, with one another as much as necessary um, at any time during that time period 
to be sure that they had a clear understanding of what progress was being made. So this is why we would like to consider it. It would, and also for us, we look at where the elementary school is with reporting out to parents and where the high school is. Right now we have a situation, if we made this change, where the elementary school formally reports out to parents four times a year with two report cards and two progress reports. The high school does it four times a year and I, I know they have some kind of progress report um, thing in there as well too. So being in the middle, we thought, well, our approach with six is right in the middle. It's making a transition from elementary school to high school, right what our job is and uh, was consistent with that. So that's another thing that we looked at. And I'd be glad to answer any questions. Carla? Um, yeah, can you clarify something for me? I think you said it and I might have missed it. Um, with the Allied Arts trimester, they take a different Allied art. Each that's semester? right. For instance, if you were in the sixth grade, mm -hmm. one of your trimesters for Allied Arts would be, there are six days in a rotation for Allied Arts. Two of those days you would be in phys ed. One day you would be in music. If you play an instrument, you would have your music, your instrument lesson at that time. If not, you would take a general music class. The other three days, the first trimester, you might be in art. The second trimester, you'd still follow your phys ed and music schedule, but you might have technology for the three other days. And then the last trimester, you would have computer for those three. Well, conceptually, Nancy, it certainly makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and what I did is probably what you would expect me to do. I took 180, divided it by three, came up with 60 days, and it looks like the first trimester would end on the 14th of December or Wednesday. Well, actually, I took 175 student days and divided it by three and came out with 57, 50, 58 or 59. And depending upon when we started, um, I had tentatively come in. If we started, if the first student day was September 7th, and we can just change this depending on how you choose to set up the calendar, would be around um, December 2nd. It's 12 weeks um, into the year. And then the second trimester would end around March 10th, give or take a few days on the other side. And the, uh, obviously the final trimester would end with the final day of school. Well, since one of the points we'll be discussing next um, month will be the final calendar, if we could have those dates plugged in, I th think it would be important to have it. And maybe um, when we talk about first, second, third, and fourth term, we can just put parents, um, Pond Cove High School only, and then middle school, so that I, I still remember the day my daughter didn't have to go to school because I didn't realize the high school at school and it was just Pond Cove and middle school didn't. And I imagine I'm not different from a lot of parents, you know, if we had everything on one calendar, I think it would be appropriate. All right. We would definitely figure those out and we've done, you know, Connie Brown and I have talked a little bit about some um, preliminary ways to set that up. But with the trimester, it would really, it sort of ends out to, not everything's a full week, but something like Every six weeks, you get a formal report from the middle school. It's either a progress report or a report card. Mark? Uh, I think the trimester works very well. Quarters seem too short. Semesters seem too long. It's just my anecdotal experience in academic uh, setups. Is there any appetite for trimesters at the uh, Pond Cove or high school? Has that ever been considered? Just curious, because it is, it is inconsistent, and I think that is a bit of a problem. Speaking for the high school, I think that we would have to relook at some of our courses because they either are offered at the year or semester courses. Also, the impact on athletics for eligibility. Uh, I think it may have a real impact on students being eligible for a particular season and how that would, I'd have to look at that, but those would be two, uh, two of the first things that would come to mind. One would be the changing of the, uh, the course selection, um, the semester courses that we do offer, uh, and, and especially in the social studies area and some of the other, other courses that are on a one semester basis. I think the direction we've been uh, moving in the last year or so and looking at feedback to parents, um, and the use of the progress report this spring might bring about that, that real possibility. Um, I think it's something we need to explore. 
Charlie? I think from a Paw and Cove's perspective that the parents would be getting a lot more feedback um, six times a year versus four. I think it's an idea worth yeah. exploring for, for Paw and Cove. Did anybody have any comments? I, I would just say that at the, um, that day that, that I spent with the uh, team leaders and the teams at um, the middle school, this came up you know, as a problem for the teachers. And I know certainly as a parent of a middle schooler for the first time this year, I found it very awkward to have the reporting kind of off kilter for the, for the allied arts. And it, it, in an effect, minimizes them because you don't see their reporting all the time. So I think it would be a positive move. And I think those longer time blocks would be very valuable. Any other comments? Rosemary? Well, I'd just say it sure would clean up the honor roll too because uh, there are kids who miss the honor roll when their allied arts are uh, on their report card that you know make it other times. And I, I still remember being at basketball games when people got their computer grade, you know, and that's always stuck in my mind. Okay. Do you have the guidance you need? Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, the next item is personnel requests, and there are various requests. So, Connie, I'll have you. I'll go through them. And this is a time of year when we uh, deal with probationary teachers. The first list is those teachers who've been with us for two years going on to continuing contract. The second list that I'll be reading is first year probationary teachers going to second year. I do want to emphasize in case you look at this and think you know some first or second year teacher whose name is not on this list, we do have teachers who are on one year contracts who have been evaluated and who would be on this list but they will, if we have openings that are appropriate, they will be posted and then I'll be bringing those names back to you. So you may not see some names that you're aware of, but that is the reason for that. Um, beginning with the continuing contract list, that's Ponco School, Deborah Casey, speech therapist, Marilyn Dale, special education at the middle school, Beverly Bisbee, seventh grade, Ellen Brady, special education, Nancy Entwistle, speech therapist, Rachel Garrett, seventh grade, Lynn Meter, Special Education, Eugenie Moore, 6th grade, at the high school, Mary Hart, Art, Kathleen Lisa, or Katie Lisa as everybody calls her, Social Worker, Christine Newell, Math, and Scott Chaffis, Physical Education. Now, I can read both lists unless for some reason or other you can take a single vote on both lists or you could take a vote on this one, whichever you would prefer. Single vote, okay. Go ahead second list, which are the second, first year to second year probationary teacher contracts, Pine Cove School, Paula Borelli, school nurse, Nancy Miles, special education, middle, middle school, David Farrick, special education, Craig Roberts, seventh grade, Tammy Stanley, special education, high school, Gordon Crosby, Spanish, and Peter Schellenberger, art, photography. Madam Chair, I move that we accept the superintendent's nominations for uh, teachers going on continuing contract and second year probationary teacher um, contracts for the 1994-95 school year. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Charlie? I have a question about the high school art photography that was concerned about his certification. Mm -hmm. um, the way in which these things are handled, uh, first of all, this is telling you that he's been through an evaluative process. Certification cannot issue a uh, contract until that is, I'm assured of that. There are three steps to hiring a teacher. Number one, the nomination by the superintendent. Number two, the, uh, the appointment by the board. And number three, the issuing of a contract. Uh, if I have uh, any issues on certification, I will clear that up before I issue the contract. Anything else? All in favor? 7-0. Thank you. We have going on, we have one retirement and one resignation. I did put letters in your packet. Our retirement is Charlene Gleason, who has been working for the last 10 years in Cape Elizabeth, um, at most recently at the third grade level, uh, and Tracy Brennan, who has been working part-time at the um, High School English Department. Rosemary. Madam Chair, I move we accept the uh, retirement of Charlene Gleason and the resignation of Tracy Brennan. Second. Any discussion? 
All in favor? Seven zero. And nominations for coaching positions for the 93-94 spring sports. You have a list in your packet. I'll read it down. Seventh and eighth grade lacrosse, Chris Carlisle. Eighth grade baseball, Tom Tinsman. Seventh grade baseball, Craig Roberts. Assistant track, Larry Greer. Assistant track part-time, Paul Jackson. JV softball, Kim Shaw. Assistant boys tennis, uh, help me with that name, please. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy. Literal Capes. Literal Capes, thank you. Sorry, Jim. Jim Literal Capes. Seventh grade softball, Steve Conley. Rosemary. Madam Chair, I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendations for coaching positions for the 1993-94 spring sports as read. I second that. Any discussion? All in favor? 7-0. And finally, we have, uh, every year we have, uh, just to remind you, we have an administrative recertification governing board. We have two nominations, Nancy Hutton as the voting uh, member with the alternate Nancy St. John. And it does need a vote. Can I vote? Do I hear a motion? Rosemary? Uh, I, I move that we accept the superintendent's wording. Um, <laughs> Second. <laughs> Any discussion? All in favor? Seven zero. Okay. We've made it to the end of our meeting. We have no executive session this evening. So the uh, meeting is adjourned. I wonder.